At the moon, Apollo 14 experienced intermittent communication problems between the command and service modules and because of a problem with the high gain antenna, but communicating between mission control and the command and service modules, you were able to continue communicating successfully. Were there lessons learned from previous missions like Apollo 11 that helped communications going from mission control, Jerry? Well, we had the high gain, which was a steerable antenna that locked on and tracked and did that kind of thing. So it, it was automatic and pointed right at us. But then we had uh, what we called omni antennas, and they were fixed that were around the circumference of the spacecraft. And so by selecting the right omni, which there was a guy in the control center uh, could tell us which omni would be best depending on his attitude. And we would have Stu or in other, we had the same problem in other uh, other missions. 16, I think we had a, a serious high gain issue, didn't drive in yaw or something. And we ended up sticking pretty much to the omnis. The omni antenna didn't give you quite as much gain. So, you, you know, TV pictures weren't as good or something like that. But the comm was okay uh, as long as you stayed on the right omni. The spacecraft was always moving with respect to uh, the Earth in some direction. So that Omni would start to get out of sight and on the backside of the spacecraft. So we'd have to have him select another one. But uh, I don't think it was a big issue. It just was a nagging one that uh, we had to stay up with. Is that the way I remember it, Fred? Do you remember it any differently? No, I I don't recall uh, having any any added problem. To uh, you just had to have uh, your uh, uh, people with the uh, like Ed Fendel, uh, Inco, the Inco. Com, the com people to keep uh, up on what Omni and tell the crew to switch if they didn't to the right Omni to uh, regain uh, high bit rate and, and voice. Yeah. Well, you know, um, uh, Fred, maybe uh, talk just a little bit about how important communications are when you're out there. You know, when you were out there on 13 and, you know, Jerry's back there in mission control and, and things are, uh, you know, you, you had, uh, you know, some some major challenges. And, you know, I think not everyone appreciates how important communications can be. Well, it, we, we could not have gotten back without communications. We had, uh, for instance, uh, <clears throat> when the command module uh, died, uh, that computer uh, is the only computer that had the, any uh, navigation capability, <clears throat> which I would say was, was not as good as what uh, Mission Control could provide with tracking data. And, of course, when, when this happened, we were not on a path that would have gotten us uh, back to uh, back to Earth. So uh, we would have never figured out what to do uh, as far as using the engines to uh, get us back in the right direction. Same way... Uh, as we went around the moon, uh, the mo- maneuvers we did uh, then to further refine our path. Uh, but also we, d- we did a lot of off nominal uh, procedures of uh, various sorts. And of course, those had to be manually uh, read up and we, we would copy them uh, to then execute whatever it was, uh, was, a <laughs> was the next workaround. Uh, so, yeah, we, we critically uh, needed communication. Well, I, I like that term, workaround. You were doing a lot of those. A lot of those, yes. A lot of those. Okay, so, you know, we, we get to 14 and we have splashdown and post-flight quarantine, um, you know, and, and, of course, it successfully came down in the South Pacific on uh, February 9th. One of the anomalies of the crew of 14 was that they were the only Apollo crew quarantined before and after you know, was there any sense at NASA after the success of 14 uh, that that it was a mission, um, and this is a good one for both of you, that saved the Apollo program after 13, that 14 had to be a success? Well, I'll, I'll, say, I'll say that certainly uh, if, we, if it had us now the failure, uh, there's no question the program would have been in jeopardy because I think the uh, – Frankly, the administration uh, 
uh, and, and the world at large felt we had achieved the goal that was set out by uh, President Kennedy of landing on the moon before the decade. So if you want to call it the key objective uh, and promise uh, had been done. Now, now the only people that were obviously champion and uh, for further missions were the, the scientists and geologists. Uh, they, they, of course, uh, really would have liked to go on all the way through to Apollo 20, which was originally scheduled. Uh, to get more landing areas uh, uh, researched uh, and samples collected, but uh, it, it would have been a it would have been a concern had uh, Apollo 14 not been able to land or had a serious problem. Uh, I think quite possibly uh, with the uh, sort of the tone, tone down of the the national fervor uh, and the, and uh, even already uh, budget budget cuts coming. Uh, that they could have curtailed the program right there. Jerry, what do you yeah. think? Yeah, I, th- I think uh, Fred's right. The, uh, you know, there was a similar situation, although more dire, I think, even between the fire, Apollo 1, and the first man flight, Apollo 7. Had, that, had 7 not worked, it was a very critical mission to the program. But it did, and it allowed us to go on. This one may not have been quite as severe, uh, I don't think we would have uh, lost a crew or anything like that. But I think a failure, just to, as Fred put it, just a failure on top of 13. Uh, you stack those two together back to back. I think it very likely could have uh, could have ended the program uh, that severe. Remember, you know, Vietnam was still hot campus unrest still very hot here in in uh civil rights movement and all and rioting and and uh the country was uh diverted uh, anyway and if we'd had a failure like that i think i think we could have lost the program well and that's a great topic you've actually segued uh, into our 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 kind of next you know here we have the you know uh, uh the 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 time frame of the mission uh, and by the way, uh, uh, Fred, you made me think of, and Jerry, you know, you have seven that was so important. Fourteen is so important. Maybe it was good we didn't get to 21, okay, that uh, <laughs> we were starting to deal in sevens there. And, yeah. Yeah. The, um, okay, so, you know, you've talked about the unrest. And, you know, here we've got the space program kind of uh, slogging its way, you know, to the moon and in a very, very good way. Uh, you know, uh, having grown up during those years, uh, certainly I remember how important I think the space program was, but maybe from uh, your perspective, Jerry, a little bit, and Fred, uh, realizing that this was, this was a high point. This was something we as a nation and even as a world could look at and say, you know what, we're still going places no matter what the, uh, the unrest was at the time. I, I've thought about that. After Apollo ended, I kind of went back and thought about the the whole thing that we that we went through, and I think we gave the American people for sure, and maybe even the world, these little glimpses. Every time we flew a mission, there were glimpses of something that was going on that was good, and it and it allowed the people to to be proud and. And that sort of thing in a way <clears throat> where they could all think together. Um, you know, it's funny I, in a way, and I, I hope this doesn't come out wrong, but we were so darn busy inside that control center. And I know the astronauts were too um, for those years that we missed a lot of it. We, you, you know, the I had a twin brother in Vietnam for a year while we were, uh, messing with spacecraft, and uh, and I I didn't miss I didn't miss it totally, but I was so busy that I I couldn't communicate with him very much, and all all we had was were letters anyway. But but it was a kind of an interesting time. We were a little bit insulated from it, and uh, as a result, we were uh, not as not as aware, I'm sure, as the general public on how 
uh, rough things were going within inside the country. I was aware of it. It, it wasn't that. It's just that it, I wasn't living it every day because I was living the space program every day, and I couldn't get my uh, I couldn't just couldn't devote that time to it. But it, it was an interesting time, and I think the American space program really was those little glimpses every time we flew. It and particularly we got to those J missions, and and uh, they kind of started reeling off in a in a nice way, I think. Uh, I think those were good times for the U.S. Fred, no, Jerry, Jerry hit it pretty well. There's certainly, uh, well, we were busy. I, I went through uh, four missions uh, back to back, uh, starting with eight, then eleven, then thirteen, uh, then sixteen. And uh, you know, I, I similarly did not pay much attention to uh, the outside world. Uh, a lot of people ask me. Uh, was I, uh, uh, we were thinking about what the Russians were doing or what we, uh, in a, and I, I never thought about the Russians. It was just, we, we had our own thing to do and we were charging as hard as we could to, uh, get the, the work done and get ready for the next mission is the way I, w- I was involved. Uh, these were, these were intense, uh, in a way, time wise beyond what people realize. Certainly eight and 11, which were when we were still on every two month launch cycle. Uh, basically within the last, uh, six weeks toward launch, we literally went to seven days a week. And, uh, it went from like you climb in a simulator maybe at eight in the morning and you'd have the last meeting and then at about 10 at night. So that was the kind of, uh, pressure and, uh, and uh, at least in the, uh, training schedules, uh, we were involved with for those missions in particular. It eased up a little bit on 13 and it was quite relaxed on 16. But again, same way about the last uh, month before launch on 16, uh, we were back to uh, about seven days a week, uh, feeling what we needed to get done to get re- really ready. So it was, uh, that kind of a work environment and you just didn't have time much to read newspapers or watch TV, uh, any news, uh, you just uh, worried about what you were having to get done to get ready. Well, it reminds me very much of that military work ethic that both of you, of course, had, uh, uh, you know, had conquered, uh, way before that. Uh, you know, I thought, Jerry, when you said, uh, letters from Vietnam, uh, the old days of uh, being on cruise, when you, you numbered your letters, you numbered the envelope right. so they wouldn't read, you know, letter eight, you know, before they read letter oh. six. Right. And, um, uh, you know, the different ways of, of, of communicating. And, and certainly, um, I remember our 8045 cruise on the USS Carl Vinson. Uh, we spent 107 continuous days in the Indian Ocean and very similar to exactly what you're talking about. Every day you got up, you were still on the ship. And, uh, uh, I always, uh, I always, uh, compared it to a Twilight Zone episode that sooner or later you <laughs> thought this is the way life was going to be forever. And, <laughs> And, and I'm sure in the space program, you know, for you guys for literally years, okay, more than 107 days, you know, yeah. every day was, was hard work, uh, uh, with great team members. So, uh, you know, you know, Jim, that brings up a point that, uh, how important, uh, our spouses were for those of us that, that had families and kids. Um, they, they worked uh, as hard as we did. You know, the spouses took care of the bank accounts and the kids and the bills and the, and it was, um, I didn't get to see many little league games, uh, or anything like that, Cub Scout or Girl Scout, uh, meetings. And, uh, but it, it was really important how, uh, and of course we were all young and, and, uh, we probably couldn't get them to do it now, but, <laughs> but in those days, it was kind of natural that you just jumped in and got it done. But very important pieces of our lives for the, those of us that had families. Fred, I know you agree with that. You two were very lucky to have, uh, uh, you know, certainly wonderful partners. And, um, um, I think you're absolutely correct. It's just, it's critical in life. And, um, and it, uh, it, it really helped a lot. And, uh, well, I, I start to get a little misty every so often when we think of some of those days, because, you know, one of the things, Fredo, maybe you can comment on this. 
you know, Jerry just mentioned kind of you guys were young, you know, uh, and, and I've always said you guys were kind of young guns out there making a significant difference. And it was it was kind of cool. Well, I, I certainly didn't look at myself in that regard. <laughs> uh, you know, I I got where I got to just following sort of a uh, uh, path that fit fit the bill to uh, be a part of the program. You know, I had uh, obviously uh, grown up as a military pilot in aviation uh, and a couple of Marine fighter squadrons and went, then uh, worked for NASA as a test pilot for seven years uh, testing airplanes to uh, sort of make me qualifiable to go into the program. So uh, what I was getting into uh, the space program was uh, similar, but uh, obviously much, much bigger with a lot more people involved. And uh, I was more involved in the development of the vehicles. The flight testing we did, except for like the X-15 program, which was a whole new machine. Uh, we normally uh, took... Uh, existing airplanes and uh in the aircraft test program and modify them to test some new feature uh and uh but i was not not involved in the uh actually early uh development uh and later in the shuttle even the design of uh, a new vehicle so it, it was kind of an added thing in my career uh from the astronaut uh, uh office days uh in that respect but no it was i didn't uh, really look at myself as a young gun i knew it was a uh, an honor and a privileged position that uh, not many people uh, uh, got involved. In fact, even today, if you look at the world at large, there's not many, counting Russians and us and everybody else, there's not many people who have gotten to go to space. Right. Still a pretty small number. Yep. So it, uh, it still is a pretty small group overall. Okay, you know, so, you know, we get 14, 15, 16, and 17 under our belt. Um, NASA, you know, transitions to the Apollo uh, Soyuz program, Skylab, space shuttle. Uh, talk a little bit about that transition, you know, to these other programs and what you were seeing at NASA, um, as it related perhaps to some of the goals. In other words, now we're going to, you know, get the International Space Station. We're going to have a, a continuous presence in space. And what did that mean at NASA for uh, uh, during that time? Well, I'll take a crack at that. I, as soon as the Apollo program ended, um, I was beckoned to Washington to uh, head up legislative affairs for the agency. Now, that's a Texas A&M engineer dealing with the Congress, and which sounds a little... Uh, funny. I was the first, by the way, I was the first guy to ever have that job that was well, not they, a didn't, they didn't know what to think of an Aggie. That's right. I knew the Senate was over here and the House was over there, you know, that kind of thing. Right. Um, but they wanted to get somebody up there that, and, and this was George Lowe, uh, who was deputy administrator at the time. He wanted to get somebody to help him that understood the technical side of the story that could explain what we were going to try to do with the shuttle. And at that point, um, Skylab had already been envisioned uh, using spare uh, hardware from Apollo. And so it was kind of going on. ASTP was kind of in the background. It had already been talked about too, um, but it came later. It came in 75. But that period from 72 to 74 was really intense trying to save the shuttle in the Congress. Uh, Walter Mondale, Senator, uh, brought up a, uh, a resolution to kill it in 1971, as early as 71. And um, it got defeated by one vote. So it was close that it almost got pulled from appropriations. That's why they got worried about trying to get the shuttle going. So that's what all I did for that four years I was in Washington was to work on the shuttle. And of course, that in that time, we reeled off uh, Skylab, which went uh, well, except for the launch of the lab. And it kept everybody, it kept everybody engaged. I think those programs were kind of bridge programs to get to the shuttle. And at that point, 
I'm going to turn it over to Fred because Fred was very active in the early uh, shuttle program and flew those uh, approach and landing tests at at uh, Edwards that were so important. But the agency, let's let's not make any mistakes. It was a signal we were going to be in Earth orbit for a long time. We were not going back to deep space uh, for some period. Fred, talk a little bit about that shuttle. That had to be pretty exciting. Well, uh, I went at it from a different tangent uh, than uh, Jerry. Uh, when I finished the Apollo 16 assignment, uh, I was thinking at that time of trying to get into uh, program management. And uh, I talked to Deke, and then I talked to uh, uh, Chris Kraft. And uh, Chris, they arranged, uh, one of them, it was probably Chris, arranged for me uh, to get a slot in the program for management development course at Harvard Business School. And I went off for four months uh, for that and came back. And uh, I was working as, as an assignment, uh, working for Aaron Cohen, who was at that time the uh, program manager for the development of the orbiter, which was the, probably uh, uh, 85% of the complexity of the space shuttle system, and uh, to develop that vehicle. And I went, I actually moved to uh, a different, left the astronaut office and went to uh, Billin One uh, on the fourth floor and joined Aaron for the next four years through a shuttle development. In fact, my first assignment, I worked on the uh, evaluation team to evaluate the four proposals that came in from four contractors to build the shuttle. So I was involved in the selection process that depicted Rockwell uh, to build it. And uh, then went off through some <laughs> some of the uh, challenging times uh, in the orbiter office where unlike uh, Apollo at its early days, uh, we started suffering with uh, budget cuts below our program plan and contract uh, from the start for the first several years. And so uh, we were we were weighing with things to take cost out of the program uh, to try to preserve schedule, which is what you always try to do. And at the same time, if we're in any flight vehicle, we were suffering with uh, weight growth. So it's kind of a two-pronged uh, set of things. Uh, it, was, it was interesting and challenging uh, to go through that to uh, try to keep it online. And uh, so I was, I stayed in the uh, orbit office. I ran the, uh, what's called that, what's called the ops team through the design reviews, through critical design review on Enterprise, which I later flew, and through a preliminary design review on Columbia, which was to be the first orbital vehicle. And, you know, working on the ops crew with me, uh, you're, you're reviewing the design. Basically, your job is to review design, the design at those points and the documentation and engineering drawings or whatever, whatever is available and uh, write discrepancies. They'll call RIDs, review item discrepancies on the design. And uh, the team I worked with were obviously some people from mission control, uh, some of our training people, some other, other astronauts. Uh, that were on this ops team to critique uh, the design as we went along uh, to getting it ready to actually get to the point of cutting metal and uh, building it factually. And that was about the time uh, where we were in the first uh, of the manufacturing process. I was lucky enough to get named as one of the two crews that were designated to fly the very first orbiter, Enterprise which didn't have that name. I forget the name it had, but the uh, Trekkies wrote a whole bunch of letters into uh, <laughs> the White House or whatever, and they, they actually effectively changed the name to Enterprise. And uh, that was all done at Palmdale, California, Plant 42, uh, where a lot of the aerospace companies are. And a the hangar there was, I think, down the line at the same time, Rockwell had, was where the Bella had been building the B-1 bomber and another hangar down the line. And uh, so we, I went to work then uh, now through the early buildup of that vehicle uh, and uh, through the testing, we did the system testing, much like I'd done on the lunar module at Grumman back in the Apollo days, uh, to get it ready to uh, over, over land, cart it over to Edwards uh, to get ready to fly on top of the 747. 
So that, that was uh, interesting, challenging times as well. Uh, one of the big, big problems we had was the uh, four computer redundant set. There was, uh, they'd flown the, uh, we looked at other programs that tried that, one in Canada, a helicopter program, in fact, which had a real bad problem. And uh, we had difficulty getting the four computers to work together. They kept voting each other out. In fact, we came, almost got to the point of saying, we're just going to forget it because we've got to make the flight schedule. We'll go fly single string, one primary, one backup string. When uh, IBM, who was the software developer for that system, showed up with a V19 or V20, one of those uh, software update loads, and that solidified the set. From there on, we the computers hung together and did their thing. And uh, so we finished uh, testing, moved it to Edwards, and got ready to fly. Now, they flew a number of un, unmanned flights with Enterprise on top to uh, with the 747. Uh, Fitz Fulton, Tom McMurtry were the primary crew. And they were really uh, testing that vehicle, which had had mods, uh, structural mods, to support Enterprise uh, on, attached on top. And uh, added two fins, added fins on the uh, uh, horizontal mm -hmm. stabilizer, more worrying about a, almost a double failure with uh, their st stability augmentation system, this SAS. But anyway, those those were added. And so they flew a, a several flight test program just with the carrier. Now, it was interesting times, too, when we got ready to launch the first time. This was in uh, 1977, and uh, we had changed presidents, kind of similar to where we are today. Uh, we had this. And it kind of, the shuttle kind of had the label of it was President Nixon's program. And at this point, uh, President Jimmy Carter had come in. And uh, it was kind of worrisome because in the debates and whatever leading up to election, there had not been a lot of discussion about space. So it wasn't clear where uh, uh, Jimmy Carter stood, although we had hopes because he was an engineer, although more nuclear engineer, but hoped he'd have a, somewhat of an affection for aerospace. And uh, but he quickly, uh, shortly after office, canceled the B one bomber program, which made us secondarily nervous, even though that's not NASA. So we're getting ready to fly this flight, and uh, was uh, at the same time uh, NASA had announced a major slip in the orbital schedule for Columbia, mainly due to the tile problem that had surfaced. surfaced. So that was in the background, and uh, it was interesting. The uh, uh, the day I got ready to fly that flight, uh, I was I would have to say I was more much more nervous than I was on Apollo 13. Uh, frankly, not for my uh, safety, because Gardo Fullerton, who flew this mission with me, this flight with me, test flight, we both were sitting in ejection seats. So you know, you, you got that's a pretty good plan B. And, uh, but I worried, actually worried about the carrier crew, uh, Fitz Fulton, uh, Skip McMurtry, uh, 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 Gidry, uh, Skip Gidry was another one, uh, Tom McMurtry was, Skip Gidry, and, uh, uh, poor fellow, uh, was also, and they were the poor crew in the 747. I knew they could not escape. If we, if the flight control was not as promised and as we've seen in, uh, engineering simulations and uh, in our simulations, including the Gulf Stream aircraft, possibly it could go because we, we tuned it high, uh, highly to have a good pilot rating uh, with the gains. Uh, if it went completely unstable and I didn't get fast enough to the backup system, we could have gone out of control momentarily because that's the first time we're going to get to see it was when we separated, how it really worked. And uh, we could have damaged the 747, and that crew would have not been able to get out. So that was my concern as far as uh, any injury or, or risk was more for the 747 crew. Well, but you know, the secondary, we... the secondary risk was programmatic. Right. Uh, that I feared uh, had we damaged or lost Enterprise at that point with that looming uh, slip in the orbital schedule, possibly... Uh, uh, President Carter may have canceled the program. And so that was the secondary uh, real concern uh, for me at, at that point, reflected by the ground crew when Gardo and I climbed aboard that morning. 
there were two Polaroid pictures on the side of the ladder as we climbed up to get into our ejection seats of, po- of these figures in blue flutes, flight suits like we were wearing, our helmets on with the visor down and auction mask dangling so you couldn't tell who they are. They're sitting on huge sweepers in a hangar that looked like sweeping city streets, big city streets. The saying there said, if you screw this up, this is your next job. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> so the workers felt a little fear of that uh, problem with the program as well. Well, you know, we had uh, we also inducted, you know, Fritz uh, into the International Air and Space Hall of Fame here in San Diego. And he was Mr. 747, you know, for the uh, for the shuttle testing. He was uh, he, he was certainly a, a real pro. So, Jerry, when all this is going on, you're back in D.C. trying to make sure all these programs are going forward and changing of presidents and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, did you get in front of Carter or any of those guys at the time? Yeah. Um, actually, uh, I left Washington in 76 and went to Edwards as the uh, deputy director of the center at Dryden now Armstrong uh, Research Center. And, of course, they were get, we were getting ready for the, uh, uh, for the ALT, the approach and landing test that, that Fred's been talking about. Um, it was a busy, busy time. And we, <laughs> interesting thing, we flew the first ALT flight, and uh, they asked me if I would go to, you know, Nicely, if I would go to the Kennedy Space Center and be deputy director there, and which I did in 1977, uh, later in the year, and and it turned out that uh, I was there through the first shuttle flight, and Jimmy Carter came to see us, and um, actually he was uh, delightful. He and he has his. Fred alluded to, he was a nuclear engineer, so he understood the um, the difficulty that we were were doing, and I think it. Uh, I never sensed that he was being, you know, kind of uh, maybe looking at us with a jaundiced eye. I think he was really interested in it. So maybe that's why, Fred. Maybe that's why he didn't cancel it uh, and and let it go on, and he was. Uh, I saw him one other time after that, uh, and uh, down at, in fact, it was at the Cape, and he uh, he was right in there. So, I guess somebody convinced him that you don't have to give it all the money in the world, but don't kill it. And uh, well, and even by the, the name- way, to circle back to your initial question, during this period, we were so focused on getting the shuttle in orbit and get it flying that there was no. At least in the halls I walked, uh, walked, there was no mention of a space station yet. Uh, we just didn't have the bandwidth to even think about it. And uh, the first orbiter that they delivered to the Cape, I was deputy director then, went out and saw it. That was Columbia uh, that was brought in there on a 747. And if you've ever seen a, a dog with the mange, uh, that's kind of what he looked like. The tiles had come off in flight, trying to get it across the country. Uh, they had stopped where for El Paso or somewhere, and I think they actually had duct taped uh, areas of the of the leading edge of the nose in the nose area, and it just looked it looked pitiful. And they had to essentially retile it. Uh, at the Cape, and they figured out how to get them to stay on. And um, so it was, a, it was a tough time, tough development, and what an amazing machine it turned out to be. Flew 135 times, and um, and it was the first time we had reused anything in, in manned space flight for sure. Uh, that orbiter uh, really came through. Well, now they've got all those special glues and alien tape and gorilla glue. You know, where was it when we really needed it? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, you know, Fred, I've always said, uh, I'm going to ask you for a second here, that the uh, that the shuttle was maybe the greatest glider ever built. And what was it like bringing that thing in? Because, you know, it, it was flying 
almost profiles that for us in naval aviation were, um, you know, high speed emergency proceed, you know, where, where you had a lock throttle and you're going to shoot the entire approach between 190 and 210 knots. And, uh, it had to be exciting. Well, it, it was a glider. Uh, it was actually a pretty good glider, roughly, uh, lift to drag similar to the X-15, about four and a half. And, uh, I say for us, think, just thinking of the other vehicles like the lifting bodies, uh, which didn't have wings, uh, it was a pretty good glider. <laughs> and, uh, surprisingly, when we separated the control system, uh, flew better than, uh, from a handling quality standpoint, than anything I had seen in the, uh, all the simulations, engineering simulations and, uh, training I had seen. So that was a, a marvelous, uh, happy moment. Uh, we did lose one computer right at separation. Uh, it quit. It was a big X on the screen and Gardo missed about the first minute of the flight pulling circuit breakers and whatever to definitely kill that computer so it didn't pollute the others. And, uh, on the way down, the missions were short. I think the longest one was five minutes and 21 seconds, uh, from the time we released to you uh, landed. Uh, Gardo, Gardo had a famous quip at the first debrief and he said that this is definitely not a program you want to build up your flight time on. <laughs> <laughs> so. I like that. I like that. Right. And by the way, you know, when you were mentioning the name Enterprise, you know, and, you know, all the uh, Trekkies, you know, uh, writing in and uh, you got to remember there was a Navy aircraft carrier named Enterprise too. So, oh, yeah. So. yeah. <laughs> In fact, they were uh, shipped they, before that with sails that uh, were right. Enterprise. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, um, okay. So let's talk a little bit of um, uh, uh, philosophy. Okay. You know, we talk about the moon, we talk about Mars. You know, uh, deep space, you know, Jerry, you mentioned, you know, we, we, because, uh, you know, I've been around enough of you guys over the years, uh, that there are some that feel we, uh, the, the International Space Station, we've kind of languished, you know, in low earth orbit and we haven't gotten back out to where we really, really want to be. So the two of you, uh, you know, this is your opportunity to talk about, you know, where you think we ought to be going. Uh, you can even drop a timeline, you know, what, do, you know, moon, Mars, Mars, moon, you know, wherever it is, uh, a little bit of free form here for you too. Well, <clears throat> I, uh, I think we're on with Artemis. Actually, I think we're on the right track. It, 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 it has, it's a bit of a shame that, that it's been so long since we've been out of, uh, further with humans than low earth orbit, but, it, it, it is what it is, so we have to accept it. Uh, if we can get back on track here now, uh, the world, according to Jerry Griffin, would be that the right thing to do is to go back to the moon first, and then on to Mars, and then question mark. Um, because I have a theory that we need to learn how to move around in deep space because I don't know when, 5,000 years from now, 10,000 years from now, 20,000 years from now, who knows. Um, We're going to use up this planet. And I don't mean global warming. I mean we're just going to use it up. And if we want the species to survive, we need to learn how to move around in deep space and find somewhere else for it to survive. So that's the very, very long, long view and we've just, with Apollo, we took this little bitty step. And with Artemis, even if we could get it eventually in some form to Mars, that's still a small step. I'm talking about big distances. We've got to learn how to do that, in my estimation. We go back to, to the moon first and establish some kind of permanent habitat so we can learn how to do that. Uh, we've never done that, and it, and it needs to be done. So we can figure out how to do that at Mars maybe better than we would if trying to go directly to Mars now. So I think we're on the, the right track. I think the art of the strategy is right. Uh, now, whether we can fund it and keep it going, I don't know. That's going to be the big question. And uh, it's going to be the big question of this administration because it's all at a critical point right now. Fred and I 
looked at one version of the lander down in Houston, uh, what, three weeks ago or four weeks ago now. And uh, it's pretty slick, but they got to have money to build it. And uh, the Orion spacecraft, the command module, if you will, of, of Artemis, uh, is pretty far along. It looks pretty good already. It looks like a real, it looks like a command module on steroids. It's bigger. And, um, but I, I think we're, we're going in the right direction. It's not going to be easy and it may get delayed. I just wish NASA could get some consistent funding. Like Fred was talking about a while ago, when you, when you start cutting program budgets and running it up and down and up and down, Guess what? You're gonna. It's gonna run the cost up, uh, and we can't afford that. But just give give NASA a level playing field, and then we work in the commercial side that brings their money to the table and their know-how. They're doing good. Um, and I'm, my last point on this, uh, so it doesn't turn into a filibuster, um, is that that I think what we're going to see in the next ten years is we're going to see the low Earth orbit domain, uh, really the, the domain of the commercial uh, people, the SpaceX's and the Blue Origins and others, the, the CST-100 that, that Boeing's building and so forth. And then that's going to leave NASA to think deep. Um, let those guys provide the transportation. NASA can buy rides as they need them. They're going to stay in low. They're going to do things in low Earth orbit. They've got to get to the space station. they got to do other things in low Earth orbit. But let them ride. They will buy their seats just like they do on American Airlines to get from inside the Beltway to L.A. Um, and that, that will leave NASA to think deep and think onto the moon and back to Mars. So I think we're doing okay if we can hold it. So uh, you would say we're go for landing. You would go for landing. Go for landing. Fred. Well, and Artemis is, a, oh, you call it the first step, what Jerry's alluding to is eventually to have a base. And there is a learning curve. And uh, what, how, if you created this uh, permanent base, if you will, on the moon, which is actually simpler to get to and fro than Mars, say, is the logistic, to learn the logistic uh, requirements to support it, much like the bases we've had on Antarctica, which do require resupply every year, change out of people, those kinds of things. So there's kind of a learning curve on this call it stay permanently. And, and it's actually a sort of a transitional uh, facet in the front end to, uh, to get that permanent establishment done. So that's kind of the lesson to learn that has to go through uh, initially, albeit on the moon or be it on Mars. Uh, I would hope somewhere where you get to a little better on uh, inventing a new propulsion system <laughs> to make it a little quicker getting to and fro Mars uh, in some way uh, than it currently takes. Uh, in the bigger picture, of course, Jerry alluded to is the, uh, the things we have to worry about uh, here on Earth uh, to uh, with the human race, uh, not just uh, outgrowing it, but uh, we have a threat of uh, meteorites, micro, uh, meteorites, comets that uh, I guess uh, Rusty Swigert uh, championed that for years. Uh, Rusty flew Apollo 9 and actually a society, society formed and uh, have a website that they say there's no question eventually we're going to get hit by another uh, major uh, meteorite. So you might say in, in different ways the human race is uh, at risk at large. And so it uh, it behooves us to uh, try at least uh, make that uh, breakthrough. I hope there is a. And speaking of breakthroughs, I hope there's a breakthrough of either the uh, the elements, assets, uh, whatever that are available, either on the moon or Mars, that will again trigger the the power of the commercial world to want to uh, mine it or, or whatever. Something that will be the driver that will provide the continuum of uh, funding and support to move outward. And, that, and with that is kind of the, the, the backbone of, of that support, uh, which is strong, as you know, uh, to, to make the next dollar is uh, uh, something that uh, makes people energetic about doing. And hopefully that will also spawn uh, that further development to establish the permanent base eventually on Mars. 
of course, philosophically, is always the wonderment, and we creatures uh, are unique in that way, at least on Earth, to think about what's it all about. You know, we have uh, billions and billions of uh, we galaxies, each of us have hundreds of millions of stars like our sun, not exactly like our sun, but similar, some similar, that uh, it's kind of interesting to continually search outward with uh, optical and uh, different uh, wavelength uh, devices to look what's all, all, all about, what the creator has set up that we are, uh, we're a part of, only a very small part of with our solar system. But there's also a hope of a continuing of just thinking and continuing uh, slowly, uh, not to our individual satisfactions as we talk here today, because we're not going to be around long enough. Uh, we only have short lifetimes, and so we can't think. Jerry talked 20,000 years. Uh, let's talk 100, 100 million years. Yeah. Uh, hopefully the human race is still around by then. Where are we then? So there's a hope for this a continuum at whatever level uh, can be supported and funding. And uh, that's that's always in this times that's always uh, going to be a challenge. Well, and certainly uh, Hubble's given us a look at uh, what appears to be infinite. Mm. Uh, you could just keep on going, and uh, you know who knows what you're going to never run into. The yeah. uh, and Jerry, your comment about uh, and I always call it cadence. You know, I think the funding for NASA uh, provides a cadence for them, so they can you know get their mm -hmm. Uh, their mojo going, you know, and that we can, you know, we don't have interruptions, uh, you know, in the program. And by the way, uh, you know, with what you just said, Fred, maybe it's the finding of gold on Mars. Okay. Uh -huh. that, we'll, <laughs> that will, that will, heck with water. We'll figure the water out. Right. We just want <laughs> to get some gold now. Okay. So the UAE, China and the United States, we got stuff landed on Mars this month. This, month. this is uh, this is kind of uh, um, yeah. you know, the space world, deep space exploration and penetration. Uh, you know, is is huge. Um, and 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 so touch on that just for a second, the two of you. But also, you also, you know, when you look at SpaceX and Blue Origin, and you know, uh, you know, Bezos has been a little bit quiet lately. But but you know, I think he's got big plans. He's changed his position at Amazon a little bit, so maybe our deliveries will slow down for you know. But but you know, it really is an exciting period to see all of this start to come together. And well, like I said, Mars, and then the gang. And what what you just said about China and other countries, India and and UAE, um, they're all in this game. It, we're not in this alone anymore. We were kind of there for a while uh, with the Russians. That was kind of it. The Japanese are right in there, um, and so it's it's still a competitive field. I really think space. I think we proved it in in Apollo. Uh, it's it's an instrument of foreign policy can can be, and I think uh, they who get there first, uh, not only prestige, not just the prestige of doing things first, uh, it's the accomplishment and the learning that they get out of it. Uh, we we tend to learn and share the, you know, the other countries don't do that. They they learn and hold it tight, so. I just I think the whole I'm I'm glad to see those other countries uh in there. I think we do better when we when we have a competitive we have a competitive nature. And uh and Neil Armstrong called it a threat. He said we do best when we we have a threat. And uh Paula we certainly had that. But I I think this is good. I think I I don't I don't begrudge him at all. I I'm not so sure I try to sound like the good sport and wish them well. Yeah, I do. I don't want anybody to get hurt. But uh, if they don't fill their objectives, it's not going to not going to affect me too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I, we all remember the George Patton speech. Americans love a winner. You know, yeah. and uh, yeah. and I think that is that competitive spirit. Fred, you know, uh, you know, the commercial gang, the uh, you know the the, the activity that's, you know, Mars is Mars is probably going, if there's anybody alive on Mars, they're probably going, we're being invaded. And so uh, uh, 
Uh, what do you think? Well, I, the, there's three three missions that imminently, I guess, approaching Mars. Uh, again, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure. I hope they find gold. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, otherwise, they have uh, instrumentation that's uh, again uh, trying searching for life. Has there been life on Mars, even at a microbe level? Micro level? But also water, which is obviously a very essential thing to have. Uh, that, uh, any, any major discoveries on those, uh, accords might, again, might be a big spark of interest, uh, to move uh, further in that, in that direction, to uh, move faster than the pace uh, we're on today by any one of these parties. Well, that's great. Okay. So, um, Okay, so now we're going to uh, delve deep into uh, uh, your memories, okay? You know, you uh, you both have a tremendous number of uh, certainly friends, uh, f- uh, you know, fellow professionals who have made this good stuff happen. Um, I'm going to ask you each, what is the moment that you remember most? You know, uh, you know, we always say that life is kind of made up of moments, and um, and so when you look at that moment for you and 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 maybe even if we talk about what you remember in the past and what will be the moment in the future, you know, for those next greatest generations, the you know, the kids, uh, because I, I tell them space is is just going to be so exciting. But what what's the moment? You're talking about in space, I say, in space activities. <laughs> well, uh, I, I guess. Well, here, could you put Sandy on for a second? <laughs> uh, well, I, I I can remember the a moment that set me. Uh, I think what I would say it. I can do this. Um, when I got to NASA in 1964. Uh, I had had some experience with the Agena spacecraft uh, in Sunnyvale, California, which was uh, uh, at that time was the upper stage on a number of spy satellites in the very early 1960s. Uh, We put several of those into the Pacific Ocean early, but we got better later on. Um, So when I got to NASA, they really wanted me to be an Agena expert because that was going to be the target vehicle that we docked with in, in the Gemini program. I got to, got to Houston. I was there about less than 30 days. And uh, Arnie Aldrich, a guy that, that uh, Fred knows well, remembers, um, came to me and said, would you consider being a Gemini flight controller? And I thought to myself, don't throw me in that briar patch because I leaped so fast because that's what I wanted to, I wanted wanted to be on the man side early on. And that moment I knew that I had a chance, but it was about a month later in a simulation in the Mercury Control Center on GT2, Gemini Titan 2 was an unmanned test flight. And it was my first time on console. And I did a simulation, and I turned around to debrief, and I was no further than six or eight feet from Chris Kraft. And when I looked into his face, and I debriefed what I had done and so forth, and so and I never will forget it, he looked, and he didn't say anything. He just nodded and smiled. I knew I had it made. And uh, that moment started my career in mission control. Uh, but wow. I, I tell you what, this, just to look at Chris Kraft in a control center, I'd heard about him for several years and turn around and look at him. I thought, my God, I mean, my voice got about an octave higher, uh, but uh, he liked what he saw, and I, I could tell he liked what he heard. So, Wow. Well, it reminds me of the great comedian Rodney Dangerfield. He said every so often, and I'll do this, you need one of your buddies from across the room to give you that old, you're doing okay, kid. Yeah. yeah. And it sounds like that moment. So, Fredo. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I was trying to think, wrestle through my mind, the memories, think of, uh, quote, that mo- best and most memorable event. And it's it really, I had many, 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 many of them, and uh, both in and out of the program and younger. 
probably the one that was most life changing, clearly the most life changing was, uh, during the Korean War when I, uh, joined and, and the Naval Aviation uh, as a cadet, uh, training program. And the first, uh, and, and you have to realize that the time I joined up, I was more interested in getting a commission, which my dad, uh, said I should strive for rather than flying an airplane because I'd never ever been in an airplane in my life <laughs> to that time, not, not even wow. sitting on the ground. So the first day, uh, after finishing pre-flight and at Whiting Field, uh, uh, I met the instructor, Hank Chenaud, who was the Navy lieutenant, was my uh, initial instructor. And Hank uh, showed showed me uh, how to get out to the flight line and uh, the SNJs, some of them engines were running. Now, the airplane was big to me, and the SNJ, <laughs> it was a big airplane. And make all that noise they were making, some of them already engines running. And uh, so we uh, got help, helped me climb aboard, made sure I got hooked in right and the parachute on right and everything. And the first time we got airborne, that was that was it. It was it was really like uh, I, I don't know, what to call it I don't know how to describe it. It's like magic or whatever. When I can now look at the Earth from not too high, really above. Uh, maybe that day we got up to five thousand feet, maybe. But to see the scenery and that from that aspect and uh, be flying through the air, it was just magical. And that, and that's uh, when I decided I wasn't I wasn't quite sure. I was on I was on the course through two years of college to be a journalist. And uh, so that day that changed everything. That day I said my career is going to be in aviation. I wasn't sure what the career was going to be ultimately, but I said I'm no longer a journalist. Now, now it's going to be flying airplanes. So that was the uh, that was the day I'd say was the most probably most uh, momentous and uh, most life changing uh, for me. Well, let me tell you, for both of you, those are two phenomenal moments because um, um, you know they were they were game changing, they were career changing, they were life changing, yeah. and uh, um, and I'll tell you, uh, we want to thank you both okay for coming on with us today uh, maybe we can do this again in the future especially as we continue on uh, you know into deep space exploration but um, you know on behalf certainly of the air and space museum uh, all of the people who will who will view t- today and uh, and who appreciate what you've done for us you know uh, uh, we always like to say here at the air and space museum we want to be an organization that connects the dots but we also want to be part of the vision of the future and so i i I applaud both of you because i think you fit that image i think you were there you made great things happen and you are thinking about and focusing on the future now i'm gonna i'm gonna kind of close it out with that for me but if if either of you or both would like to say something uh you've got an awful lot of fans out there and uh let me tell you you know i salute both of you and thanks for being our friend friends well i i will say on a on a serious note that i think uh san diego air and space museum does a probably one of the finest jobs in the whole country on uh, not only presenting history, but also using the educational aspects. Um, Your education department uh, just does a fantastic job. And at the same time, Fred has Infinity Science Center that is uh, uh, outstanding. I just wish we could get out of this pandemic, Fred, so you could uh, get the doors open again and get going. But uh, I I think uh, uh, you guys are making a difference, and uh, uh, I salute you for that. No, I, I, my my feeling about uh, museums is that they uh, they offer an opportunity for obviously adults, but. Uh, I was more interested in Infinity when, as part of the, the uh, raising the money to build it and uh, uh, get it running for the sake of the children. Uh, 
I look at it as a, 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 stealth, a stealth learning experience uh, because they, they come and they can uh, touch things or hear about things uh, and uh, have fun. And they have, they have a fun day uh, at the museum and without realizing that they learn things that That's stick right. with them because there, because there are uh, amazing things they see and do. And so it makes a real impression. And I hope in some cases steers them into a career, maybe along the lines of some of the things they see in museums. But maybe, but in any case, uh, I, th- I think that's what museum, museums provide uh, for children, which are obviously very important because that's, uh, that's our future. It is. Well, we agree. We, we have a sign out front that says, enter for fun. And while they're having fun, we can educate the living daylights out of all of them, you know, but if they're, well, you know, it, and I tell this story all the time. I said, you know, if, if, if someone says, Hey, do you want to go somewhere with me? You know, the response is, well, are we going to have fun? And so if we can, if we can get that fun equation down, okay, the rest of it is, uh, is kind of easy. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I have to tell you, you two make it just so wonderful for us. And um, uh, I just can't uh, express enough how much we appreciate your friendship, uh, what you've accomplished, and um, and the visions that you give. Uh, like I said, I, I, I've always said because my parents were the greatest generation, okay, that World War II uh, grouping. And uh, we have to believe that there are future greatest generations because that's really what makes us do what we do.